Hello, hi everyone. Um, okay, so quick disclaimer. If you came or saw my thesis defense back in July, this is basically the same talk. I tried to shorten it. Try, try, I know it's strict 15, but I tried. Um, uh, so yeah. My talk is titled Ayake Kumu Vai Vai Ma Makalogana Analysis of the Natural Resources Within the Makalogana Inclined Pool Complex. So today I'll be walking you through an introduction to North Kona hydrology and geology and local oil fight. Then we'll get into the hypothesis one, which has to do with physical chemical properties of inclined pools, then hopefully onto hypothesis two which has to do with Bopayula abundances. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. Ooh. Okay. It's not playing. Hold on one sec. There we go. Okay, I wanna take you guys there. So let me set the scene. As we all know, and as we felt this morning, the lower regions of Kona are very dry and arid, as you can see here. And with a nickname of Kekaha Vaiole Ona Kona, meaning the waterless Kekaha of Kona, it may seem like that's true. However, the Mocha or upland regions are often shrouded in clouds and can be very wet. Sorry, this is. And although there are no surface waterways connecting the upper wet regions to the lower arid regions, there is an abundance of groundwater that seeps through the porous lava rocks which you can also see in this video, showing some local waiupai in the middle of this lava field. In fact, Hawaiians considered the people of an ahukua or land division uh, that had local waiupai as ku ono ono or very wealthy. Depicted here are two of North Kona's aquifers. The Kiholo aquifer in the upper darker green color is recharged by waters from the Hulalai and the Saddle which is an area between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. The Kelho aquifer in the lower lighter green color is recharged by waters from Hualalai and Mauna Loa. These three shield volcanoes, Hualalai, Mauna Loa, and Mauna Kea, which provide sources of water for North Kona, have also been changing the topography and geology of this area for centuries. This map here is showing the different lava flows that have occurred in this section of North Kona. Ages of the flows are from light blue to dark blue, with more recent flows being the darker blue color. The dotted red line is approximation of a rift zone, which is an area of low permeability rocks, typical of shield volcanoes. And for now, you can ignore the yellow outline, but just for reference, that's the Makolovena Ahupua, or land division. So a couple slides ago, you heard me use the term local waiopai, and you've been hearing local waiopai or waiopai a lot. Um, and local waiopai is one of the Hawaiian terms used for inclined pools. Where local refers to a pond, lake, or pool, vai refers to water or any liquid that is in seawater, and opai refers to shrimp, since many of these ponds are home to a variety of shrimp. Traditionally, these pools would be used in a variety of ways, each pool serving a unique purpose. For instance, the fresher pools would usually be used for bathing or drinking water. Other pools would house schools of fish or be used as sort of a refrigerator to keep certain sea life contained for later consumption. I use the term local waiopai because of the numerous accounts of these pools being occupied by the thousands of opai. In certain areas, like the North Kona coast, opaiula were gathered to, to use for traditional opalu or macro fishing practices. This project that I did is actually part of the efforts being made by the Kona School's Natural Resource Managers, and I've been very privileged to work at Makalvena, which is privately owned by Kona Schools. And because of that, there is very little development nearby. In fact, there's no paved road to get to Makalovena from the main highway or any plumbing or running water of any kind, which did make um, a bit of a hassle for field work, but it also meant that there are very few direct human impacts to the area. Makalovena has over 50 local waiopai with a variety of physical, chemical, and biological influences. 
This map here is a zoomed in version of the lava flows surrounding Makalabela. Same as before, the younger flows are the darker blue colors and the older flows are the lighter blue colors. The Makalabena Ahukwa or land division is outlined in yellow and the rift zone area is marked with a red dotted line. I do want to point out that the rift zone is just that, it's a zone. So think of the dotted line as more of an approximation of where the rift zone could be. And as you can see, most of Makalabena is surrounded by a flow that is dated 3,000 to 5,000 years old. However, there is an older flow under that dated 5,000 to 11,000 years old, and Makalavena is very close to that rift zone. Because of these different lava flow ages and Makalavena being adjacent to a rift zone, I predicted that these geological features would affect groundwater flow paths and the physical chemical properties of the local oil pipe waters would vary across different regions in the Makalavena local oil pipe complex. So this map is a Google Earth view of the sites I chose to study. If you recall, most of the coastal parts of Makalavena were surrounded by the same lava flow. <coughs> However, during my introduction to Makalavena, I noticed the northern region was surrounded by an a'a -a flow, which is this area. The mid region was surrounded by pahoi hoi, and the southern region was surrounded by a mixture of a'a -a and sand. Of the 13 ponds chosen for this study, four were in the north region, which are marked by the blue circles, four were in the mid region, which are marked by green circles, and five were in the south region, which are marked by red circles. The filled in circles note predators are present, and the outlined circles note no predators are present. Sampling was conducted over four field seasons, two during ko, or dry season, and two during ho'oilo, or wet season, which is the season we're in now, um, with each season being host to a new moon period and a full moon period. This video playing here in the top right is depicting the discrete sampling methods. You can see me in the background placing two YSI songs into the water to test the physical parameters, such as temperature, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and pH. I'm also recording Opaiula abundance estimations and predator presence. My field partner, who's going to come out in the foreground, is collecting water samples to test for dissolved macronutrients such as silicate, phosphorus, and nitrogen. The water samples are then placed on ice while we transport them to the lab to filter, and then we filter them onto a 0.45 micron filter, uh, then store those filters for downstream microbial processing, and then the filtrate is sent to Nelha. Uh, in, right here in Kona. Once all the samples were processed and I had all of the data, I was able to analyze the physical chemical properties of each pond. So here we have a principal components analysis plot or PCA of those parameters. Each arrow represents a physical chemical parameter. The hor horizontal axis, PC1, explains almost 58% of variability. Whereas the vertical axis, PC2, explains about 14% of variability. PC1 is positively correlated with salinity and negatively correlated with all of those guys on that side, which includes silicate, TDP, TDN, phosphate, and nitrate nitrite. Uh, PC2 is positively correlated with temperature and negatively correlated with dissolved oxygen, pH, and ammonia ammonia. Each dot represents a sample the colors correlate to region, where the north region is blue, mid is green, and south is red. Here we can see the north ponds form a distinct group with distinct water chemistry that is characterized by higher salinity and lower nutrient concentrations. To see how the different north pond or to see how different the north ponds were from the mid and south ponds. I ran a Crespel Wallace pairwise comparison, which confirmed that the North Region ponds were significantly different than the Mid and South ponds, in not only salinity, but also in silicate, dissolved ox uh, total dissolved phosphorus, phosphate, total dissolved nitrogen, and nitrate nitrate. So something is definitely causing the North ponds to have a very distinct physical chemical property. But if you recall, the North ponds are the closest to that rift zone. 
so it can be possible that the rift zone extends into Makalabena. This may be evidence that there's a hydrological barrier between the north ponds and the rest of the ponds. For hypothesis 1.2, I wanted to know if that heterogeneity will affect Upaimuna abundances. I hypothesized that it would affect abundances since high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus can be harmful to aquatic life, and Upaimuna aren't able to reproduce in high salinity environments. So, how did the abundances look? For a discrete sampling, I took the estimates for each field season and averaged them out, then created a bubble map. Each circle represents a pond site. The north ponds are blue, mids are green, south are red. The size of the circle corresponds to an Opaimula abundance index, which I created, which are pretty much just bin categories, where bin zero means zero opai, one means one to 99, two means 100 to 249, and all the way up to bin six, which means over 1,000 opai. So for instance, the big green circle in the center there seems to be pretty steady at an Opaiula abundance index of six, which means it averaged over 1,000 Opaiula, whereas the north pond seemed to have very low abundances, averaging of less than 100. But how do those abundances correlate with physical chemical parameters of each region? Here we're looking at a correlation plot for the north pond. Since we want to focus on these parameters, um, on how these parameters are correlated with abundance, I'm highlighting just the Opaiula abundance column. Uh, so in the north, Opai abundances is negatively correlated with DO, pH, and nitrate, nitrate, and positively correlated with silicate. Here's the correlation plot for the mid ponds. Again, Opaiula abundance is in the right hand column, and we can see that for the mid ponds, Opai abundance is positively correlated with DO, silicate, phosphate, nitrate, nitrite, and total dissolved nitrogen. This is the correlation plot for the south ponds, and we can see that Opai abundance is negatively correlated with pH, nitrate, nitrate, and total dissolved nitrogen, and positively correlated with total dissolved phosphorus. I know that was a lot, um, so let me like break it down. So for the mid ponds, I only use the data for two ponds, the two ponds that um, had Opaiula and didn't have predators in them, which are pots and golden pots. Since the mid correlation plot showed no negative correlations, and those were the only two ponds without predators, we may be able to say that the negative correlations in the other pond regions are due to predator presence. With that said, the parameters that were negatively correlated in the north were slightly different from the negatively correlated parameters in the south. So these negative correlations may be due to something more than predator presence, such as maybe microbial differences, which may be due to a hydrological barrier between the north region and the other two regions. So I just got the three minute warning. We're not gonna have time to get through hypothesis two. It's really cool stuff. Please come talk to me if you're interested in abundances, but I'm gonna just skip really, really fast. And all the way to the end. Sneak peek there. Two conclusions. Okay, so to wrap up, based on the physical chemical properties of the North Ponds, um, the, well, the North Ponds are a distinctly different group from the other ponds. Abundance seems to be affected by the physical chemical. I keep popping this little thing up. Sorry, the physical chemical parameters, but those effects may have something to do with predator presence. And from the correlation differences in the ponds with predators, we see further evidence that there may be a hydrological barrier blocking the water exchange for the north ponds. Let's get these things. And mahalo to all these wonderful community people, organizations, uh, funders. And I will take questions at one minute for questions. <laughs> Yeah, so um, like we just saw in the last talk, um, uh, the North Ponds have very little uh, input, so that could have something to do with it. 
um, whereas the mid ponds do have a lot of vegetation around, and then the south ponds have that sand mixing in and a, and a lot of human activity. So yeah, that could be it. It could be that there's just not enough vegetation up there and that's causing the differences, yeah.